video tells the story of how we were able to successfully captive breed hermit crabs. We are the third in America to do so, and we are so excited to share this information. All of this turned into this, which is called a chrysal, which mimics the ocean and is necessary for hermit crabs to breed in captivity. This is a zoe, which is a baby hermit crab. It's really teeny tiny and it lives in the chrysal. When I say really teeny tiny, I mean really, really teeny tiny. Fully mature hermit crabs can spawn up to 20,000 zoe at a time. Raising these zoe over their gestation period is near impossible. Not only do we have to mimic the ocean, but we also have to clean out this ocean or chrysal twice a day, which means we have to pipette the individual zoe in and out of the chrysal every single day, twice a day. For the 30 days after they hatch, we clean out their chrysal and feed them tons until eventually they turn into these, which are called megalopa. These megalopa are showing signs that they are ready to take shells and adventure onto land. Eventually, one brave little megalopa baby will take a shell and oh my goodness, look how cute he is. Soon after, all of the other crab babies will follow suit and they all began tucking their butts in shells. Over the next several years, these baby crabs will eat, molt, and grow and repeat that cycle over and over and over again until eventually they look like this. The current hermit crab industry is extremely inhumane, ripping these precious babies off of their beach homes. Captive bred breeding is the future of hermit crabbing and we are so excited we could be a part of it. Welcome aboard Crab Central Station. You guys, my name is Darcy and I am so excited that you are here live with us on our YouTube channel for an amazing announcement. We dropped a video yesterday. Hopefully many, if not all of you have already watched that video and maybe you already know this epic news, but if not, you guys, you are in for a treat because tonight we are bringing you some information that we have been keeping secret for three months and i'm just so relieved that we can finally talk about this with you guys we can share videos and pictures and chat with you and just talk about the whole experience um, it's been so hard to hold it in these last three months and so i'm just so 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 excited thank you so much for joining us um, we have lots of people here from all different platforms and we so appreciate um, our crab crew. So thanks for being here. Um, we are going to go ahead and take some of the questions that you guys have already been sending in and answer a few of those right here on um, the front side while we wait for more people to join the live and then we'll get into the big announcement. So Brooke is behind the camera running the computer. So thanks so much for that, Brooke. And Faith made that TikTok you guys just saw. That was so good. Um, she did a great job on that. So like I said, if, if you're new to the channel, this is a family thing and um, I'm the mom and then Brooke and Faith are my daughters. And so we do all of this together. But anyway, so we've been working hard to bring this for you guys. And um, Brooke is gonna ask some of the questions you guys have already sent in. Someone asks, are you planning on getting more hermit crabs? Well, I don't know that we plan on getting more. We do rescue, foster, and adopt out. And so um, every once in a while, I will get somebody that contacts us to see if we can accept a foster or take in an adoption. But I don't know that we are gonna actively be planning on adding to our colony at this point. Um, so, but of course, we're always trying to help you know, help people out who need to get out of the hobby for whatever reason, um, or who find crabs in a bad situation that need to be rehomed. You know, we try to do our best at helping in those situations, so. All right, the next question is, let's see. Did you end up using filtration in this breeding attempt? That is an interesting question, okay. Um, <clears throat> Yes and no. <laughs> the, 
the the idea the desire was to yes use filtration and that is what i tried in the beginning uh, but i could not get i couldn't get it working and so ultimately the answer is no um, but that is definitely a goal that i have is to figure that out and make that work because i do think it will make the whole process a whole lot easier and better for the crabs um, and i think a better outcome in the long run of course that's all speculation but um but yeah i still need to do some tweaking and playing around and we had definitely had some issues um with that early on so Someone says CrabCon, question mark. Yes, CrabCon, you guys. So um, we will come out with some more information here pretty soon, actually. Tickets are gonna be going on sale January 15th. So anybody who's unfamiliar, CrabCon is all thing hermit crab. We have lots of really great speakers. If you've ever wondered anything about hermit crabs, CrabCon's the place to go. A lot of great vendors, um, just great things to do, chat rooms and things like that. You can get to know other crabbers. Um, adoptions, of course, um, have been a part of CrabCon the last three years. And so this is the fourth CrabCon 2022. It will be completely virtual this year, um, but plans are already being made for next year's to be um, in person from what I understand. And so tickets will go on sale January 15th. Of course, we'll put links for you guys. We'll put up a video and all that. We don't want you to miss it. But anybody who was around for last year's CrowdCon, you guys know that the VIP tickets sell fast. And so if that is something that you're interested in and you want all the swag, um, then you definitely want to start putting those pennies aside now to save it for your ticket. So. All right. The next question is how long once a baby comes to land before it is big enough to be amongst a population of larger hermit crabs? So they don't get adopted out until they're about a year old. And at that point, it's completely up to you if you want to add that baby crab to your current colony of adult crabs or if you want to house them separately. Um, studies are showing that they do really well with the adult crabs, that the big crabs kind of teach them what to do, um, and they seem to be growing at a better rate um, within all the studies that we have so far. But you can choose to do either one at about a year, a year old. How do you know when a hermit crab has a baby? So your female hermit crabs carry their eggs in their shell. And um, once you kind of just have seen the process enough, you get really familiar with their, um, the way that they look when they're turning the eggs inside of their shell. Um, and so then you can kind of take your flashlight of your phone or an actual flashlight and kind of shine it in there. And then you can see the eggs in the back of their shell. Um, and so you're really just waiting for those eggs to become mature and um, before they get ready to spawn them in the salt water. And depending on the species of crab will depend on how long the gestation is of those eggs. Our experience so far is somewhere between uh, 22 to 28 days um, that they carry them. So. All right, I had a question, but I lost how many hermit crabs can live in your tank since it's so huge? Our rule of thumb is 10 gallons per crab until you have jumbos, which we do have a couple of jumbos because we have brevies that are really, really big, like softball size. Um, and so you're looking at 10 gallons per crab. And, it, you know, so it just depends on how big your tank is. Um, and, and that is, no, that is only the base tank, okay? That's what you're looking at for your gallons. These toppers do not add to the amount of crabs that you can safely keep in your tank because this is just vertical space for climbing. When we're talking about safety and the amount of crabs you can keep in your tank, we're talking about molting safety. And so um, even when you put a big pool like this, you would have to subtract this 10 gallon pool from your gallons of space you could safely house crabs in. So, um, so we, we have 740 gallons, 750 gallons, somewhere in between there. And so um, we could safely house, I would say about somewhere between 65 um, because we do have some jumbos, so we want some extra space for them, so. 
All right. The next question is what breed or species are they? <laughs> Good question. We will actually get to the answer of that here in just a minute when I kind of talk about the attempt a little bit. Um, um, someone wants to know who did the hermit crab art behind you. Um, so her name is Unreal and she's a graphic designer. Um, and so we just hired her. Um, she's amazing. So we just basically told her kind of the idea of what we were wanting. We gave her all the different species of crabs that we have, and then she just started to do some design. We did give each of the characters personality up front, like what, what we wanted them to have, being from Texas, uh, proud Texans, and so we kind of wanted that theme um, with our characters, and so yeah, that's kind of how our branding got started, and um, it was, she was amazing to work with, so yeah, we're super, super happy with how things turned out. Hi, Rita. Nice to see you. Uh, is, someone asks, was it harder during the winter as your last attempts were during summer? Um, so this attempt wasn't actually during the winter. We do know somebody that um, is currently, has Zoe right now. Um, well, uh, Mary, oh, okay. Mary has Zoe right now as well and so it's so it's really strange our breeding season tends to be like in the dead of the summer um, but mary's is closer to the end of the summer and into the fall and so i'm i don't know what causes that it's very interesting because the uh, parameters of our tank are similar as far as humidity and heat um, but for whatever reason the actual region where you live plays a role um, in your in your breeding season so all righty someone says I knew they were going to ask this. Why did you keep it a secret for so long? Okay, <laughs> so the reason is because this spawn happened right when school started for me. I'm a teacher, and <clears throat> this is the first week of school when this happened. And Brooke was already away at college, and Faith was already away at college. And so it was just me here um, working a full-time job. And so there was just only so much I could do, only so much time in a day, only so many hands to actually do the work and hold a camera and set up the room, you know, um, to film and things like that. And so just something, guys, something had to give and it was the vlogging. The vlogging had to be the one thing that we just didn't do. That doesn't mean I didn't record anything. Actually, we have tons of footage you guys are gonna see some of it tonight, um, but it's just not already in a finished video. And so we'll be sharing more and more of that with you guys as we go, but that's the main reason. And um, then, so then we were just in the middle of it, in the middle of making it happen and uh, things were progressing. And trust me, there was a point in this attempt where I was like, why, why did I not video this? Like I felt so horrible that we had brought you guys along on every attempt. And then things were looking so positive and I was like, this, this is gonna be the one and then we didn't bring everybody along. And so I actually had some major guilt for a long time. Um, <clears throat> but you know, you just have to do what you can do and that was all that we could do at the time. Um, why we waited this long to share it with you guys is mostly because again the girls were away from um, away at college and, I, and I've been working full time and for one person to film and produce a video um, and go through all the footage is just a lot and so kind of I needed my team back. <laughs> we needed to all get together to, to pull a video like this off and we wanted it to be good and we wanted to have a live with you guys and so it's just a lot for me to do by myself, basically. And so we were waiting for all of us to get together. Of course, then it's the holidays. And so we had a lot of plans with family and just enjoying our holiday. Um, and then actually we got COVID. And so <laughs> that kind of delayed things. We were hoping for this to be like a, a New Year um, announcement on New Year's, but um, we all got COVID and so it kind of slowed us down a little bit more, but we're all doing better now and so um, so today, yesterday and today is what we decided we could, we could get together. So, so that being said, actually, let's go ahead and get into a little bit about review of what's going on. And then we will have more time for questions here in a little bit, you guys. But I do want to share 
um, some stuff with you. So first of all, all of you that are just joining, welcome to Craft Central Station. We're so glad that you guys are here. If you haven't watched the video that we um, released yesterday, it was our 2021 year in review. We kind of told you guys some goals that we met, some things that we did we didn't even know should have been a goal, which is so exciting. Um, and then we, we gave you the probably best news that we could have um, for us, for Craft Central Station of 2021, which is that we have successfully bred hermit crabs in captivity. Um, this was our sixth attempt that was successful, and we currently have captive bred babies on land in our crab room. In fact, Brooke can go to a live cam of the babies right now to show you guys. They are crawling around in their transition tank. So this is a live feed. Um, we were able to pull that together for you guys tonight. Um, so first time seen alive is, um, these are Crab Central Station 2021 captive bred hermit crabs. And they are tiny, so hopefully you guys um, can see them there in the cam. And they're all of their cuteness. They are so amazingly adorable. I could watch them all day. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, so that's what we announced yesterday in our video drop. And today we just wanted to come on here live, you guys, to share some of the story, some of how this all happened, and to answer some of your questions as well, um, and just share with you guys what, what's been going on. So um, we'll go back to this live baby cam throughout this, this live tonight, but we do have some other pictures and we have some other videos that we definitely wanna share with you guys. And so um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a overcap of this attempt, okay? Um, so it began on August 27th. So when we came to um, the spawn, it was, like I said, it was the first Friday of the first week of school. And we actually, I would just came into the crab room to feed them on the way to a football game. You know, it's Texas, so we have Friday night lights. This is back in the fall. So August 27th, it's our, our first football game. I, I came in here to feed the crabs and make sure everybody was doing good. And lo and behold, there were Zoe in our saltwater pool in our big build. We had already packed everything up. We thought breeding season was over. We had already had all the chances we were gonna get in 2021. And literally everything was disassembled, cleaned and packed. I had actually completely disassembled our double chrysal because of, you know, any of you that have been following us, you know, we had that coral kind of growth in, in our attempt number five. And so I had to actually take apart the entire chrysal and I have to rebuild it for next summer. Um, so it was already disassembled actually, the double chrysal. Anyway, so here's this surprise spawn in our pool, and I was freaking out, actually, to be honest. Um, I went live on Facebook, I think it was, with you guys just to say, oh my goodness, look at this, what am I going to do? <laughs> and, um, of course, I couldn't just leave them. I mean, I can't just leave them in the pool and not give them any chance at survival. So um, I, I have a single chrysal that we had put together. And um, I was like, I'm just gonna do what I can do. You know, I'm gonna work full time and I'm gonna see how this goes. Um, in this picture, you guys can see the single crystal that we used um, and all of its glory and mess. <laughs> um, you can see that it's definitely been used in that picture. I'm doing a water change actually in that picture. You can kind of see the um, siphon. But anyway, so that, that was August 27th. Um, then I worked, you know, every day um, doing our water changes like we normally do. And I had to do two a day. So every morning before I went to school, y'all, I got up and did a water change by myself because remember the girls weren't here. So I was up at about 4 a.m. and um, started doing water changes and then you know had to have enough time to actually get dressed and ready for work. And then um, I would do a second water change at night. I tried to start them like around nine o'clock so I could still kind of get some sleep, but um, between eight and nine, I would do the evening water change. During the middle of the day, when they needed to be fed and nobody was here, um, you know, I would come home. I, luckily, I live really close to school, so I would run home on my lunch break to feed them. Um, I fed them before I went to school in the morning. I fed them as soon as I got home in the afternoon. 
and then you know in the evening it was no problem because I was already here well in between the morning and the lunchtime feeding my husband would come home and I had strict instructions on exactly what to do and so he would actually do that feeding for me um, and so it really worked like I mean it was working I didn't think it would work but it actually was working and the days were going on and we were having a lot of them survive um, and so that's kind of how we did the feeding and the water changes um, some of you asked me about the filtered Chrysler in the beginning and I did try that but the problem that we ran into is that the mesh on the Chrysler um, was too small for the rate that the pump was pumping in the new water. So I didn't have enough flow out and I had too much flowing in. And so I tried drilling additional holes in the vertical um, part of the pipe and I was hoping that would release some of that water pressure and slow it down and it did, but not enough. And so basically, um, if you guys remember in the summer when we had the strawberries and we had um, our filter mesh got clogged and that caused the Chrysler water to rise and actually spill over and we lost a lot of our strawberry Zoe. Um, basically that's what was happening, but very, very quickly. And so, you know, in the middle of it and, and working, I just didn't have time to mess with it. And so I went back to the old standby of just using, doing the manual um, Chrysler. So that's what I did for this whole entire um, attempt. So that's pretty much what I did. And then um, lo and behold, on September 21st, we had our very first megalopa. You guys can see a picture of him under the microscope right here. Yes, this guy was looking right at me. Yes, I shed tears, like actually shed tears. I got to watch them transition and shed from Zoe into megalopa, like right in front of me. It's so amazing. Um, and their little claws pop out and they're the sweetest things. Um, but yeah, I put them under the microscope just to get a close look at them. And um, isn't he like the cutest thing ever? So anyways, that's under the microscope of one of our very first megalopas. And these guys in this picture that you're looking at right now are feasting on their very favorite food, um, which was fresh lobster. And I know this looks like a ton of food, but it was the smallest little pinch that I could manage to get and it still looks huge next to these megalopa. So they are so tiny y'all, so tiny. This is a medicine cup, a legit medicine cup. And look at how many are in there on that piece of, of um, lobster. So basically the reason they're even in this cup is in the, in the tank with the megalopa, um, the, that transition tank. I would put the food in there. Now that they have pinchers, they eat totally different foods than they do as Zoe. And so I had fresh lobster in there. And um, of course they go over there and they're pinching and eating it and they wouldn't get off. And so I took my tweezers and I had to pick up that tiny little piece of lobster and they were all stuck on there. And so I needed a place to put them. And so I put them in a little tiny medicine cup. And then with a pipette, I had to suck them one at a time off of that lobster and put them, <laughs> put them back in the transition tank. But anyways, that's what this picture is. And you can, you can see how many there are and they have great color. Um, I think it's because they were just loving, loving that lobster and they ate shrimp and salmon and um, clam, oyster. So, uh, so yeah, and they, we had seaweed in there. Um, so that's, that's what this picture is. And then look at these three little guys hanging on. So this is a white, Corningware dish that they're on right now. So when we first found Megalopa, I was siphoning them out of the Chrysler into the regular water change jars that you guys have seen us use um, for all of our water changes. And by the time I had finished getting all the Megalopa, which that first day there weren't even that many, by the time I got them all, they had, they and the other Zoe that also get sucked up with them in the jar, had cannibalized and I had only a couple megalobas surviving after that first morning. Devastating, right? I was like, oh my goodness. Um, and so I was talking with Mary Akers about it and she suggests that we have more surface area that once they're megalopa, they don't need, you know, the depth isn't what's important in that they would have more space to get away from each other. And so I was like, great, this is, yes, perfect. And then she had reminded me that, you know, having something white will really help to be able to see the megalopa. Um, which she's so right. Um, and so of course I go to the kitchen, and I'm like a dish, I need a dish and you know, baking ware, why not? And so 
that's what they're in right now is just a um, casserole dish. And that's what we ended up using and it worked great. We didn't have the cannibalism after that first day. Of course, Faith also came um, to help because we realized that that was a time of urgency, um, that you couldn't leave the Megalopa and the stage five Zoe together. Um, and so we were, we were siphoning the megalopa from the chrysal into the baking dish, and then Faith was pipetting the megalopa as they came through the siphon. She would pipette them back into a separate baking dish so that we had two dishes being separated from the stage five Zoe and the megalopa, and I was working over here in the chrysal. So it was quite the ordeal at four o'clock in the morning before I went to school, uh, but it worked. It worked. And we also realized that we needed to feed the megalopa immediately. They are ravenous. I'm sure, you know, just all the energy to actually go through that transition. Um, and so we ended up putting food in those baking dishes um, for the megalopa as well, which seemed to really help. So that was megalopa. And then um, that was on the 21st of September. Then on October 8th, um, that is when we had our very first megalopa take a shell and come to land. Um, yes, many more tears of joy shed as I watched that tiny itty bitty baby climb up that bridge and breathe air for the first time. It's just very miraculous. It's, I can't explain it. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. So, so yeah, that was on October 8th. And so in just a couple of days, well, tomorrow, tomorrow they will be three months old. Um, and it's super, super exciting. Um, this picture that you guys are looking at is one of our first guys that took a shell. You can see him over there hanging on to, I think this was clam actually, um, a piece of clam. And he's just hanging on to that uh, clam inside of that medicine cup. We, there's some other megalopa on there too that haven't taken a shell. But isn't he the cutest? Look at his little eyes poking out under the shell. I just love it. This is um, just another shot of the megalopa that had taken a shell. So this is on the bridge itself, pretty close to the water's edge. Um, I put a little bit of the lobster since that was their favorite right there. Um, I mean, honestly, to help hopefully get them to come towards that water's edge. And I had tons of shells all around there too, um, so that they would take a shell, love their lobster, eat that lobster, get the energy they needed to make that final trek all the way over to uh, the land tank. And so that's what this is a picture of. I can show you guys actually, since that's up there, let me show y'all that, <clears throat> excuse me, that crab on the left is wearing a shell this size. Let's see if I can even show y'all how tiny it is. Can y'all see that? Focus on it. It's just too little. Yeah. Let's try again one more time. Just so you can see how little, little, little. Can y'all see that? Or can you see it? Mm. Kind of. Anyway, <laughs> you get the point. Like it's tiny, right? It is teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, and so they look kind of big in those pictures, but they're, don't let that fool you. These guys are, even though they're in a shell, they were still itty bitty. And so that's what that picture is. And we have some more for you guys. Okay. So after they made their trek all the way across the bridge to the little land side, um, I would then take them from that land tank and put them in the, in their official transition tank, land tank. Um, and the main reason for that is just easier for me to keep count. Okay, I know how many made it over there that are keeping on a shell. Um, and this way they, they would um, be able to be in their forever tank and go and molt and not be disturbed and that sort of thing. And so this picture is of those shell babies. Once I take them, they made it across the bridge. I put them in this transition tank, which is the tank that you guys see in the live feed. That's the same tank. That little dot next to that crab on that leaf is a literal drop of water from a pipette. One, one literal drop. You can see how big that is. And that's actually a lot of them, the first bits of water um, that they drank were from those droplets that I would just leave on the leaves around the tank. Because 
I was just so afraid like they wouldn't that they would dehydrate before they ever made it to the actual water pools which were shells by the way like these tiny little shells were their first pools and I had several in there for them but they were so tiny and they're in a five gallon tank what you guys are looking at on that live cam is five gallons it's so small um, so that kind of gives you the perspective but I was just afraid you know by the time they actually made it to the water pool if they could make it I, I just I don't know, maybe it was unwarranted worry, I'm not sure, but I just put drops of water on all the leaves um, several times a day just to make sure that they could get water you know, easily and readily. And the same with the food. I kind of sprinkled dried shrimp in the lichens and the moss and things like that, um, the seaweed. It would just be sprinkled around the tank so that they could always find something to eat close by um, and have the energy to just continue uh, thriving and living. So. Um, I'll do that again. I don't know if that was part of the success, but um, it worked. And so I'll definitely, you know, continue that. But that's what that picture is. And this is probably one of my most favorite pictures. Um, guys, this is the first crab baby that actually went down and molted and then came back officially as a land crab. So this is my very first official successful captive bred hermit crab. You can see how tiny it is on my finger and just completely breathtaking um, and precious and I'll just cherish this photo forever but you know of course I don't know which one that is now. <laughs> you can't keep track of them like that. I wish I could have but um, but anyways I'm just glad that we were able to capture it um, in a photo. So one of my favorites for sure. Some people want to know what species they are and also they want to know um, what you did differently this time that they um, made it to land. Um, do you want me to move to the videos? Or do you want to stay on the um, So let's go back to the live cam just for a second. I'll answer those two questions. All right, so the species, you guys, like I said, it was a surprise spawn. I didn't even know that we had any crabs still carrying eggs. So we actually don't know what species these babies are. Uh, we are leaning towards purple pinchers. Um, even as Zoe, they behaved a lot like purple pinchers. They're looking um, a lot like Mary Akers babies at the same stage. Um, when we look at pictures under the microscope from when they were Zoe going through the different stages and changes, um, they line up to the illustrations that we have of, um, of purple pinchers. And so that's, that's where we're leaning, but we can't say for sure. Uh, just yet and some things that I did differently so for one um, the RO water was huge um, I am fairly convinced that that was where our algae growth was coming from in our first uh, several attempts that failed um, why they died at day 11. yeah why they died at day 11 why we were seeing the same pattern consistently um, I, is the, it was our water I mean I don't I don't know what's in our water that's causing it, but switching to the reverse osmosis water has made a huge difference. Now, as you guys know, we had the RO water for a couple of the um, attempts that we failed on um, before this one. So yes, we made some additional changes. Um, one was that I took the filter out because, you know, but that's how we lost a lot of our strawberries and enigmas was when we had that overflow problem. Um, if we wouldn't have had that overflow, I, I actually think we would have gotten a few of those guys um, because we made it to day 22 and 23 with them. And so they were just uh, days away from transitioning. We just didn't have very many because we had lost so many in that overflow. Um, the other big, big change that I made is that I did something that I'm calling direct feeding. And you know, when we did water changes before, I was always trying to avoid Zoe because as you know, watching the videos, the more Zoe I suck up into my water change jar, the more I have to pipette back, which takes so much time. Well, this time I went ahead and sucked up. I actually brought all the Zoe to the light in the chrysal. And actually we have a video of that, Brooke, if you want to pull that up. Sorry, I know we're switching all around a little bit. We have a video. Uh, no, I don't have yeah, that one right there. Okay, so in this video, you guys, I actually have a flashlight at the front of the chrysal and it's bringing all of those babies up to the front. And when they were little, I actually siphoned them all up, as many as I could. 
into the water change bowl. And then what I did is I direct fed over, I, I used the, the pipette and the little chopstick and I directly fed the food right over all of those babies in my water change jar. You know, I had my flashlight and I had had them all over here. And I would just drop that food right over them and they were just going crazy for it. And then I would bring them to the opposite side of the jar when I was finished feeding them. And that would mean all that residual leftover food had sunk over here. So I'd bring them over to this side of the jar and I actually, instead of pipetting, I siphoned these as many as I could, as quickly as I could back into the chrysal. And so that meant that I wasn't putting as much food in the chrysal, which wasn't you know, fouling the water as quickly and I didn't have to do as deep a clean. Um, it was directly feeding the food over them so they were getting more of it. Like their color was amazing right from the start. Um, and so I knew that they were getting enough food by doing that. Well, once they had gotten um, bigger, and in this, that video that you guys are watching, I just, I did the same idea of the direct feed, but I did it in the chrysal. So I just brought them all to the front and I dropped the food directly over them. But by that time, when they were that age, I was really only feeding um, Instant Baby Brine and the Live Artemia. And so um, neither of those really fouled the water as much as a lot of the powdered dried foods. Um, and, and Nanoclopsis was constant through the whole process. Um, and so that's really um, probably the, the biggest change that I made um, in feeding that I think really, really made a big difference. So. Are we going back to the videos? Sure. Um, so we have that video. We all saw that one already, so here's the next. Okay, so this, we had a picture of this one. This is the lobster in the, y'all can see the medicine cup now. So um, you can see just how tiny that little piece of lobster is. And there's so many uh, megalopa just chowing down on that lobster. And uh, this is by far for sure their favorite food. Um, but anyways, I did have to pipette them out of there one at a time and put them back into their little transition water part of the tank. Um, and so that's what this is a video of. Okay, this is the actual water's edge on the bridge. And you guys can see I have some shells there and there's a whole lot of more shells out of the picture. I mean, I am really zoomed in because you know, these guys are so, so small. But this is some of them just looking at shells. I mean, these are, you know, glimpses you guys into megalopa. Uh, looking at shells and trying to decide if that's one that they want to take on. You can see the water moving a lot because um, I had three air stones going in there um, constantly moving the water. Um, and so that's kind of why the shells move around a lot. But you can see them grab onto the shell with their claws and they start to check it out just like the adult crabs do. And then they tuck their little butt in there and um, decide if they want to keep that shell or not. And there was a lot of not. <laughs> So it gets so frustrated because I would be standing there watching them and they finally would get in a shell and they would leave it on for a little bit and then they would take it off and go back into the water. And so uh, that part was so frustrating. And I would have a lot of megaloba come up to this water's edge and come right on out of the water without a shell on. And I'm just standing there saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to have a shell. And so then I would take a pipette and get some water and I'd squirt them back in. Um, over and over and over again and so you know it's it was um, it was a lot of standing over the tank for many hours watching watching if they were going to take a shell putting putting them back in the water changing the water oh my goodness water changes in that transition tank uh, was a whole nother whole nother task to undertake and um, I do think that is probably what I'm going to have to change the most, you know, for the next um, attempt. And it's just learning how to change that water better, getting it cleaner. Um, I fought water quality um, constantly because it's a smaller amount of water and a lot of megalopa eating and pooping and, um, and the shells hold a lot of debris in them. And so trying to squirt those shells around to get the debris out and the poop out and all of that, um, it was a constant fight to keep the water quality 
but I have some ideas on some things to do differently next time that I'll definitely try um, that will hopefully you know be more positive positive. and we had over a thousand megalopa which is tremendous like huge um, I was so excited um, but we ended up having only 67 of them actually take shells and come to land. So that's pretty low, um, lower than, you know, Mary has experienced and Sue and, and other people. So we definitely have some improvement to work on. I don't think it was shell choice. Um, we're using all the same kind of shells that Mary uses. And, um, you know, I think it was more water quality. So, and I think maybe feeding too. Um, same kind of idea, trying to figure out how to direct feed or bring, you know, bring them more close close to the food all together. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to do that with the megalopa, but those are kind of the thoughts that I'm having. This little video, isn't he the sweetest? Okay, so something in this video I can point out to you guys. Notice how their eyes are kind of, and their whole torso, looks kind of jello-y like um, so you can definitely see that their exoskeleton is still really soft um, there's not a hard exoskeleton and this guy i mean literally is at the water's edge you guys breathing air for the first time um, and they're so small and glass-like legs um, and so that's one way that you can really tell that they have not had their final molt um, to being actual land hermit crabs Sorry, guys. is um, they still have that kind of jello-y look to them so Sorry, I don't know what happened with that video it just wanted to stop working so very strange but here's here's our next one and this is the five gallon tank I was telling you guys about their um, their land tank and I've got two little tiny shells of this size um, with different types of food that we're always changing out, just giving them a tiny little bit. And um, they have water pools. You can see the shells. These are their earlier ones with the shells being the water pool. And I was still worried that they were gonna drown in there, so I put their little tiny ladders to get in and out. But I have now upgraded them um, to the bigger pools, which y'all can see in the live feed. Um, they have lichens in there, sphagnum moss, leaves, bark, those are constants, um, seedweed, those are just constants in the tank. I also have some snake skin in there, worm castings, green sand, and calcium all the time. And then we are always just switching out their food. Um, a lot of times, just what we feed the big crabs, we feed the little, the babies, um, just on a much smaller scale, and I make it really fine, kind of powdery. Um, but a wide variety um, in their diet, lots of protein and tons of calcium, like I said, just always having that calcium, because they are constantly molting. I mean constant um, molting, and, and they molt really fast, so only, only you know a few days to a week. Um, and lots and lots of shells, as you can see, because there's a lot of babies in there, and I don't want them to fight over it, and there's a lot of different sizes, and so you know every once in a while I just go in there and take out some of the smaller ones and add a few of the bigger ones, um, and that seems to be working pretty well so far. This tank actually, I mean you can see the bigger pools here. Um, this tank is actually inside of a 40 gallon breeder and right next to this five gallon land tank is where I had the transition tank with the water and then the bridge over to the land. And so all of that was within a 40 gallon breeder. And the reason for that is the heat. Um, so we needed to keep it nice and warm. And so it has um, a heat mat across the entire back, just like we do with our hermit crab tanks. And then it is completely sealed. It has its a, a lid so that, um, it can keep the heat and the humidity in there. And so um, that's where they are. They, they have a second lid on top of their land tank because um, you know they can climb. And so I don't, I don't want them to climb up the silicone and try to get out. Um, so there's a top on their tank and then there's the top on the 40 gallon breeder um, to keep the heat in there and everything. But, but yeah, that's their land tank. Sorry some of the videos, when they run out, it just goes to that blue screen. So that is basically, in a nutshell, pretty much CCS Journey to Land attempt number six um, that was successful. And I know a few of you asked, you know, how many crabs we still have. You know, we made 67 to land. Are they all still living? I don't think so. 
Uh, I don't think I have 67 in there at this point. I don't actually know the official number because like I said, they are constantly going up and down and they're, you know, so hard to identify which one is the same one, you know, that I just saw last week or whatever. And so um, I don't have a final count at this point. Um, in order to get that, I would have to actually set up another tank. And then as they came up from molt, I would have to slowly move them one at a time over to that other tank and be able to count them, which, which I may do now that they're three months old. So that could pot, uh, potentially be the next step um, so that I can know exactly how many we have. But I'm just guessing based off of numbers that I do see um, that we have somewhere between 40 and 50. Um, that's my best guess uh, right now. So, so yeah, that, that is our, um, that is our, our successful captive bred breeding story, you guys, with some video and some pictures. I hope that y'all enjoyed that. Um, I do have something else that I wanted to show you guys live. So <clears throat> once we were successful, um, Mary Akers sent us some very special mail and I've had this on my desk for months now but I have not opened it because I wanted to open it live with you guys and tonight is the night. So I am gonna open this with you guys. I'm like literally so excited. Ah. Well. I don't want to rip what's in here, so I'm trying to be real careful. And also not showing the addresses. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, look. Okay, this says breeder certification. Like, I'm shaking. Um, Hermit House and the Land Hermit Crab Owners Society hereby certify that the breeder named below has successfully raised captive bred, I'm gonna cry, <laughs> land hermit crabs in accordance with Hermit House breeding practices. This certificate entitles the holder to adopt or sell using the Hermit House name and with full support thereof. Breeder, me, Darcy Madsen, certified by Mary Akers on October 18th, 2021. So there you go, you guys. We are officially, officially captive bred hermit crab breeders with the Hermit House um, breeding program. And I, I'm just so excited. Um, there's a lot of sweat and tears and hard work in this. And, uh, you know, I'm just super, super excited to be a part of this movement of changing an industry. When we started our channel, this, this is our goal. This is why uh, we started our channel was to make a difference in the industry. And when we decided to give breeding a shot, I don't think we really thought we, we would be reaching this goal um, this quickly. I didn't, did you think, what do you think, Brooke? No, I thought that well, especially with all the attempts where I was there, especially when they were dying at day 11 each time, we were yeah. so discouraged because we had no idea why and we thought it was something we were doing wrong, but it was just our water. And I think just like time after time again, every time you fail, you're like, you just, aren't, you don't think it's going to actually work yeah. the next time because the changes you make are so minimal because you yes. don't know what's going on. So you can only change little things at a time and then you're yeah. all of a sudden like you did it so yes yeah can you, can you explain a little bit what it means to be a hermit house breeder so mary acres was the second person in the united states to successfully breed hermit crabs in captivity but the most successful um worldwide that we know of you know in the amount of numbers that she has brought to land um, and so she's the only one so far that has actually been able to have enough to adopt out um, and make a difference in that way. And in fact, just this fall, so excited. She um, has partnered with Josh's Frogs, the very first retailer to offer captive bred hermit crabs, you guys. 
Um, and so to be in the Hermit House Breeding Program means that we are um, under her mentorship. We, you know, she's taught us, um, we're using her methods. Of course, she learned from people before her. You know, every failed attempt was attempt in learning that we all gain from. And that's why, you know, we share with you guys because in order to actually make a difference in this industry, um, it's gonna take a lot of us. And so we just have to be willing to share with each other the ups and the downs, the good, the bad. Um, and so it, it means that we are, we are part of the pro, we're part of her breeding program. And so that- that means we're ethical breeders. Um, we have the same mission in um, changing the industry. The why we're breeding is the yes. same. Um, if you're getting a hermit house bred hermit crab, then you know that these are bred with love and care and for the right reasons. Yes. Um, rather than another breeder who is not certified, which there aren't any right now, but in the future, if that happens, um, they may not be ethically bred because you know so there are people that don't breed ethically. So that's yes. what it means too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, we would definitely not be where we are without Mary and her love and her support. And I mean, yeah, she's. We've learned so much. Um, we've become great friends, um, you know, and we also want to send out thank you to Risky Petronto from Indonesia, um, who even in the middle of his night, which was the middle of my day, would answer some of my texts when I'm like thinking I'm going crazy and didn't know what to do. Um, he helped a lot with this attempt too. Um, Sue Brown, she's a breeder, a hermit house breeder actually in Australia. Um, and she also helped us quite a bit. Now she's actually just successful in bringing second generation captive bred um, hermit crabs in Australia and also currently has Zoe um, that she is raising right now. And also we want to thank um, Stacy Griffith. She's, you know, she's our leader of Lycos and we definitely would not be where we are without Stacy Griffith um, and without the whole Lycos family and Crab Street Journal and all of the history and research and you guys just, you know, being able to breed in captivity goes way beyond just raising the Zoe. Um, it, it goes to proper care and that has taken decades of learning and researching and people willing to share um, with others. So we would not have been able to do this without all those people. We're so thankful for them. Um, speaking of Stacey Griffith, you guys, I just wanna share this amazing book that she just released over the holidays. Um, this is her first book on hermit crab care. It's beautiful, full of lots of great pictures. Um, it's on Amazon. So if you guys are looking for great hermit crab literature and everything you could possibly wanna know about how to properly care for hermit crabs, it's in here. Also, we are published in this book. Our attempt is published um, as current captive breeders as well. And so some of you may have learned about this ahead of time, um, but check out that book um, for a great read and to support a great cause as well. Really quick, we have gotten two donations, super chats. The first one is from Patty. And she says, congratulations, and this is a big win for Hermit Crabs. And she donated $10. Thank you, Patty. And Manda says, thank you for changing my life. You and your family are amazing. And she donated $50. Thank you so much, Manda. That is amazing. Guys, all the donations go right into the breeding program. Um, it does cost quite a bit to, um, to run this program. And um, salt, for one, let me tell you, the marine salt. You go through a lot of it, but the foods and the equipment and things like that. So thank you, thank you so much, you guys, because without you, um, we wouldn't be here either. And so we appreciate your donations, your encouragement, your support, all of your ideas, you know, when things weren't going right and just um, knowing that y'all care enough to comment um, and to watch our videos and um, to be there with us, it just means the world. So we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to finally, finally be able to share this with you and now to share continuing video and pictures of our sweet babies um, who will eventually need new homes. I can't keep all of these babies um, myself and so definitely um, we'll be needing adopters. If you haven't already applied to be an adopter of captive bred babies, you guys can go to um, lycos.org 
forward slash adoption and you can sign up there um, and fill out the paperwork to be captive bred adopters. Um, Josh's Frogs, they have Captive bred babies right now. Mary Acres babies are there waiting for forever homes. So um, if that's something that you want to do, um, have the space in your tank and want to support this movement, you guys. Um, it takes both the breeder and the adopter to make this work and to make a difference in the industry. Um, and so we thank you so much for that. And that is all that I have on, on our attempt that I wanted to share with you guys tonight. So we will open it up to some questions. And those of you that are signing off, I just want to once again thank you for being here for this live and for, um, for our journey. And we'll continue to share um, more breeding with you this summer, um, which we're super excited about, um, you know, having some more attempts this summer. All right. So we have a few questions about the use of the word megalopha when um, in Stacy's book there is a new term. So do you want to just clarify that? Yeah, um, so I just haven't transitioned to the new word. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. I'm just using the old terminology um, at this point. So. Yeah, yeah. Stacy did all her research for this book and realized that we are all using the um, improper terminology for megalopa, um, but we just have to learn how to pronounce it, and then and then we'll be good, <laughs> guys. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You y'all are all right. Yeah. We do have the wrong word. Look at y'all doing your reading. Yeah. Wow. That means y'all have Stacy's book. Yeah. Um. So just let, give us some time to transition <laughs> to the new word. Yes. We will correct it. Don't worry. How about this? These babies were raised on the old terminology. Yeah. So I feel like I can call them Megalop. <laughs> we have another super ch super chat from Miss Christina. She says, you guys are amazing. Thank you for all of the videos. They helped me so much a couple of months back when I first got my baby. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm glad that we could help. That's what we're here for. Yeah. All right, let's see. Some questions, questions. I'm sure there's questions. Um, it's gonna take a second for me to find one. Um, do you wanna talk about the adoption and um, did you already say that? I might have been reading comments. Okay, um, adoptions. So fill out your paperwork. Um, because we are part of Permit House Breeders, um, we will, our applications will go through the Lycos adoption program. And um, so you can fill out your paperwork now, even though they're not ready to be adopted because they're only three months old. But you can go ahead and get pre-approved um, and that way you are ready. Um, or, like I said, there are captive bred babies that need homes right now. So you can get Mary Acres um, captive bred babies now. Um, after that, so this coming summer when our first babies are up for adoption, um, we are still working on the final details of how many will actually be up for adoption. Um, we are going to keep some for the breeding program. Um, we'll be monitoring them for characteristics, activities, you know, how active they are, coloration, uh, personality, are they friendly, are they, you know, coming out and things like that. So we want to, you know, when you're looking at breeding long term and changing the industry, you get to start to pick those things. And then you get to start to breed generations of crabs that are active and have beautiful color, um, you know, and have great personalities. And so we will be keeping some for the breeding program. Uh, we'll be sending some to Mary Acres because you also have to start to think about um, genetics and so if we send some of our crabs with our our colony's genetics to her and um, and then we have some of hers uh, captive bred babies already then you can start to have a mix of those genetics which is something important to think about um, and so then after those two numbers um, come out whatever is left again I told you I don't know the final number um, what whatever's left out of those this very first you know CCS Journey to Land, attempt number six, the first ones that uh, made it. We, we don't have the final details on it yet. We're working on it, but you know, it's only been three months, and so we, we, uh, we don't want to give any misinformation or mislead you guys, um, but we will absolutely let you know um, how the adoptions will take place and make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and following us on our social media so that you can hear right away um, how to go about adopting them if, if you're somebody that wants to adopt the first ones. Yep. Um, 
Someone asks, how long have you guys been trying to breed baby hermit crabs? So one, one complete year, um, but two breeding seasons. Uh, the breeding season for our crabs is in the summer, usually starts around June and then ends the end of August, beginning of September. Um, and so we started in 2020, the summer of 2020, and then um, didn't have any that made it to land. And then our second breeding season was this past summer, 2021. So two breeding seasons, but really one year. And we have vlogs on all of the attempts, except for this one. Um, <laughs> we will have a video about this attempt. Um, we're actually going to try and do something um, kind of like what we did with the last attempt, but um, I don't know if we can say yet. Probably not. So you'll have to stay tuned. Oh my goodness, we have another super chat from uh, Teresa. Um, and Teresa says, thank you for all you ladies do. My Krabbies and I thank you for all of your support. And there's a little guy with a cowboy hat. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank y'all so much for all your support. Let's see. Someone asked, is there a risk breeding siblings? I assume like inbreeding um, when you were talking about the yeah. other crabs. I mean, we don't know for sure because it's never been done, but I mean, we are, yeah, we're already making plans to avoid that from happening. So yeah, we're, we're thinking that way. Yeah. We don't know and we don't want to find out. So we're going to be swapping genetics so that um, eventually the whole line will be captive bred. Right now, um, there's only one second generation batch of babies anyway, um, and yeah. that's one captive bred crab with one wild caught crab. So, mm -hmm. so far we're still good. Yes, and that's in Australia only yeah. that we know of, so. Let's see. Um. Maybe I answered most of your questions during the live. It's just I have to scroll through everything. Someone says you're taking apprentice, apprentices someday, right? Yes, actually. Yes, we have talked about that as well. Um, we will eventually, you know, all of us breeders take under our wings somebody else. It's the only way that we can hope to advance the breeding program um, to make it, you know, big enough to actually overturn the industry, which is our eventual goal. So. Yes, I don't know that um, I feel ready for that yet. Um, I need a few more successful attempts under my belt. Um, like I said, I still have some things I need to change in the transition tank uh, to have better numbers there, but eventually, yes, eventually. Someone asks, um, how old does a hermit crab have to be to carry eggs? Well, you know, um, we don't really know the age of wild caught crabs. And so that is just something that we are currently learning, but I can tell you that um, one of Mary's captive bred babies carried eggs this breeding season. And so they are three years old, right? 2018 is when they were born. Yeah, So almost four. Yeah, over the summer. So they're 2018s and they carried eggs this past summer. Um, and so that's the, you know, these new captive bred hermit crabs are the only crabs, um, you know, that we know their actual age, where we can start to, at, you know, answer those, those actual questions about age and, you know, maturity for breeding and things like that. So we're learning a lot. <laughs> um, someone asks where you got the ramps for the water bowl. I guess the ones in the video. Those are from um, Mary Aker's Pottery Studio, which is called Earth, Water, Fire. You can find her on Etsy. And she has, those are little dot, tiny ones. I know they, perspective is so hard on camera, but I mean, you wouldn't want those ones. They're so, so, so small. But she makes like normal hermit crab size bridges and ladders and dishes, and they're beautiful. And we have a bunch of her stuff in our tanks. So yeah, go check her out. Um, someone asks, would you say it's okay to breed with a wild caught hermit crab for more genetic diversity? Well, we're gonna have that naturally because we all have wild caught crabs in our tanks. So um, the only way I guess that wouldn't happen is if I never introduced 
the captive bred babies into my main colony and always kept them separate, uh, which I don't have plans on doing that. Um, so I think there will always be some wild caught crabs, at least for you know a really long time, I would say. Yeah. What do you recommend for people who want to start breeding? Um, I mean, first year crabs have to show, you know, mating behavior and, and carrying eggs, um, which starts with proper care and husbandry, which, you know, that's where we started. And um, I, I, I think that, you know, space is huge. Um, I think having a lot of room makes a big difference in, in crabs breeding. Um, I think the size of pools make a difference. You know, basically, I think the crabs have to see that the resources are there in order to reproduce. Um, and then they have to feel comfortable, they have to be healthy enough and have the correct environment to do all of, do all of that. So I would say start there. Start with your basic care and um, really do the best that you can to create an environment as close to their natural environment as you, as you can. Someone asks, can different species breed and how many species are there? So it has not been documented that there's crossbreeding um, between species at this time. Um, again, this is so new, you guys. We are the only the third person in America to do this. Um, and, you know, worldwide, it's under, under a dozen. Okay, so 10 to 12 in the world. So I don't know that I have all these answers for you because we're really discovering this and learning this along the way. And um, I can tell you that in our own colony, I mean, we have seven different species and I have seen this past summer, our 2021 um, season, what appeared to be mating between different species. Um, I don't, uh, we didn't see any eggs produced from that activity and so, um, it may not have been mating or at least not successful. So does that, does that answer our question? Like, no, they can't crossbreed because nothing was successful from that. Um, I don't know yet. So, you know, I think time will tell. But a lot of people don't have this amount of species in captivity. In nature, these species would not crossbreed because they don't live in the same region of the world, most of them. Um, and so we don't think we don't think that that's possible right now. Yep, they might like do the mating behavior like you said, but couldn't have eggs. Right. Which I think people are saying is they just have done that, but they don't have eggs. Um, all right, are there any more questions? Am I missing some? Might be some way back. Are you loving this live baby cam? I can see it like on the back side of the camera. I keep, I keep watching them. <laughs> it's so fun. Maybe we'll have to do just a live stream of just the babies. Yeah. Or we could do our other crabs now. You guys, the equipment we're using for this stream, we bought um, two hours before <laughs> the live stream started. Yes. So this is our first time using this camera and microphone, and we actually have two webcams now. Yes. And we just got Best them. Buy for the win. <laughs> Are you going to celebrate their birthday? Um, we should. I should. Maybe we could do a virtual birthday party when they're one. That would be so fun. Yes. Um, but are Megalopa still swimming? I would think that they are, so I've not finished with the swimming stage. Um, Sue says that. I'm not sure what you're referring to, though, Sue which part or maybe there's a comment I'm missing. Megaloba are still underwater. Yeah. Well, Sue Brown knows cuz she Okay. She's yeah. she has them. <laughs> oh, so you're not sure what her question is. Yeah, I'm not sure okay. what she's saying. Hi if Sue. You can clarify that would be great, but hi. How much will one cost? I know we kind of already answered this, but just to reiterate. Yeah, we haven't we do not have any details yet on any of that. So, um, stay tuned. We're working on all of that, but it's not been decided for sure. Yeah. But this is never about the money, y'all. Like, 
We're not, we're, this is not, this is, this is never about the money. Um, this, this is about changing an industry and the only way that we can keep wild crabs on the beaches, um, you know, is to raise captive bred hermit crabs and, and then that way the wild crabs get to stay wild. Um, and so it's really more about changing the horse of the industry than, than it is about money. But, but yeah, details to come. I mean, money is a part of it in that, this is the hard part of it, honestly. Like, and I know Mary struggles with this too. So in order to change the mindset, you, you do have to value the crab. Um, if we don't, you know, if I just give away captive bred hermit crabs for free, um, that doesn't change the mindset. It doesn't change their value in, in the eyes of the public. Um, and even now, you know, wild crabs are so cheap, that's why people think they're throwaway pets. That's why they're like, yeah, well, you know, if they don't live, they don't live. So in order to change that mindset, you do have to put a price on it. And, and you do want it to be a valuable price because you hope that that price uh, creates value in the eye of the person buying it um, and keeping it, which then, you know, then in turn, they want to give it the best life possible. They want it to live, they want to thrive. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's just the way that, that it is. Um, but it's not, that's not why we did yeah. this. So yeah. yeah, it has to be, I mean, Mary sells hers for $50 a crab, right? Yes. Um, Josh's frogs, I believe they're $50 a crab and then you have to pay shipping. You know, they do have to be shipped. And, um, I honestly don't even know what the shipping is, but it's great. You know, the it's overnight, it's safe, it's guaranteed and that sort of thing. Like, mm -hmm. um, so it's pricey. The shipping part is pricey too. But it's just so we can make sure A, they're going to good homes. People that actually want them will pay a higher price for them because they yep. know that the being in captivity part is a big deal for the industry. Um, and also, um, what was I going to say? Oh, it just goes back into the breeding program as well so that we can all continue um, to breed. Yep. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to find some questions, guys. Do you want them to keep the questions breeding related for the slide? Uh, yeah, let's probably do that. That's a good idea. So if you have questions about captive bred hermit crabs breeding or the hermit crab industry, we'll answer those. But if you have personal care questions, um, leave a comment on a different video and we'll answer you there. Yes. Uh, will you be upgrading their tank as they grow? Um, the babies, yes. So like I said, they are currently in a 40 gallon breeder um, and that tank is actually already set up. So my, so I wish I could show you on that camera, but um, so right now there is, I have a stand in the 40 gallon breeder that the, the Megalopa transition tank sit on top of. So I had two big Tupperware tubs. One was the water side and one was the land side. And then there was a bridge um, connecting the two and that is sitting on a platform so I can easily just take those two tubs out um, and then I have a platform for a great second level you know that would would stay there um, and then the five gallon tank that you guys are looking at right now is actually sitting on top of the two water pools that they would use in the big 40 gallon breeder and um, the two Tupperware containers that I put in there have lids um, and they're very sturdy and so I just have the lids on those two containers and the the tank fit on top of there just perfectly and so the idea behind that is once I'm ready which I don't know if three months is going to be it or maybe four I'm not sure but um, eventually I will start to take them out of that five gallon tank and move them into that 40 gallon breeder um, and that's where I'll get my final count and I'm not going to open those really big pools just yet because they're they're pretty deep um, I might do that, you know, closer to nine or 10 months or something like that. So instead I'll continue to have their, their smaller little shell dishes, which are plenty big enough. I mean, they can fully submerge in those um, and I'll keep those for the time being because it's gonna take a while for all of the babies to come up from molt. And so I have to leave that five gallon tank there. And I don't, I can't, now that I'm putting new, now that I'm moving some into the 40 gallon breeder, I can't mess with that substrate. 
um, and so I can't have that tank sitting directly on the sand. So that's kind of how I set it up with the idea of having upgrades along the way. Um, and so within that 40 gallon breeder, I have three upgraded tanks just um, kind of engineered in there. So that's the plan. Um, and then once they um, are in that 40 gallon breeder, that's plenty big enough for them until they get adopted out at a year, so. The next question is from Tina and Tina asks, how do you deal with the losses emotionally as they develop um, that doesn't discourage you from continuing? Well, we get discouraged. It, we were often discouraged. Um, I think it's important to have a great support group, um, you know, along the way. And for us, you know, our mentor was a huge, you know, Mary's just so great. She's been there. She knows the emotional roller coaster. And so she could be our cheerleader and say, you know, don't hang your head. Just do your, go through the motions, keep doing the steps, trust the process. You know, they're not all going to make it, you know, and those types of things to just help us out. Um, and in our Lycos group and you guys on our channel, like really the comments that y'all leave really do encourage us. And we're like, okay, like we're going to keep going. Like they still believe in us. They're not giving up. Um, and so I think it's important that you have a good support group and you also, it's your mindset. Like, yeah, I, they're not all going to make it, but for every, you know, one that does make it, it could be, you know, one more difference that a wild caught crab gets to stay in the wild. It's one more step closer to making a difference in the industry. It's one more attempt in gaining knowledge and experience to be able to help other people and mentor other people. So you have to really think of, you know, the, the broader picture um, and keep that in focus during those hard times. Uh, but it's not easy. I mean, uh, it is not easy. And I will tell you, while there were tears of joy as they were taking shells and coming to land, there, there were tears of sadness because I, <laughs> oh, sometimes I would take the megaloba and actually put them in a shell because I had already squirted them down into the water so many times and they just kept coming up out of the water without a shell. And so I would put the pipette by their claws and they would grasp onto that pipette um, and I would just chip, pick them up a little bit, which meant their little hiney was like swinging there in the air. And then with tweezers, I held the shell and I literally placed the megaloba's little butt inside of a tiny shell and then placed them right there at the water's edge. Um, and there was just time like they just wouldn't keep on a shell. I, they just w wouldn't, you know, and I don't know why. Um, I couldn't make them. And so, you know, at some point you just have to say, that uh, that wasn't meant to be. You know, they wouldn't have made it once they got to land for whatever reason, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, so I just have to make some changes next time, learn from this experience um, and, and do what I can, you know, to make it better next time and hope that that makes a difference, so. And we have a super chat from Red Dragon who says, have you guys considered a Patreon to support your breeding project? First of all, thank you for your support. And um, Patreon would be so cool. We have talked about it a couple times and it might be something that we look into doing um, in the future. Where I struggle with it right now, just to be completely honest with you guys, is that um, as Patreons, I feel like you deserve that additional content. That, that's why you become a Patreon. Well, in order to give you additional content, somebody has to create it. And right now, as a family, um, we're going through a transition as far as you know, Faith and Brooke being in college. And so um, that was something that, you know, we, we didn't feel like we could do at least this year, um, this school year, I should say. And so it's definitely something that we'll continue to think about and thank you for the suggestion. Um, and that would be an awesome way to have some um, constant and consistent supporters of the breeding program. Um, so we will think about it. This is the first um, year that we have consistently posted every other week without missing an upload. And so we just had to do that first yeah. <laughs> and then um, we can try and do more later. Um, I know for when we went to college, most of the videos we put out were pre-recorded in the summer, mm -hmm. um, which is why they may seem like um, kind of, I don't know, 
out of date compared to new information coming out. Well, I guess not really. But we recorded them way in advance to putting them out, and we still have some pre-recorded. Yes. And so um, we just don't have time to record new stuff as, um, like, and then these babies came. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I've been doing for three months. Um, it was a lot of work in the beginning, you know, all of September, and then, you know, part of August and part of October. Now they're pretty easy. I, the workload now is not, you know, not a whole lot more than what you'd have to do for these guys. They need water more often because their dishes are just so small and there's a lot of them in there. Um, but, you know, it's not like constant like it was in the beginning. But. Um, this question is, do you know how long the industry has been taking crabs from the wild and why they never, the industry has never tried to captive breed um, now or until now? So, I mean, as far as I know, forever, ever, ever since hermit crabs could be purchased, they've been caught from the wild and, and resold. Um, why have they not been captive bred up until now and why, and it's still not you know, um, something that's wildly done is because one, um, it's so cheap to buy them. So retailers just, you know, buy them from distributors and it's just so, so cheap. And a captive bred hermit crab would be a lot more. Uh, and so that's a big reason. And then secondly, because you guys, like it's so hard, it's so hard to breed hermit crabs in captivity. Um, you know, Mary Akers, her first success was in 2018 and um, and then she's had successful breeding attempts since then. Um, before her, there was one person, um, Timmy, do you remember her last name, Wyke? Yeah. Is that right? Timmy Wyke, um, which she actually, her success I believe was in the 90s, um, but not enough to adopt out. You know, she, her success and she kept hers in her own colony um, and that, and then us here in the United States. And so that's not enough breeders to overturn an industry and meet the demand of sales for hermit crabs. And um, the price point is a big part of that as well. The knowledge of them and how to care for them is part of it too. There just hasn't been, you know, a lot of education readily available um, to the masses. And it's been a slow process, you know, like us and uh, Crash Journal has been at it for 20 years. 25. When it was like 20, Lycos is 20 years, right? And Crash Street Journal is 25. Is that right? Something, yeah, I think so. S close to that, I believe. Um, and so, you know, they've been educating and advocating for a really long time. It just takes time to get the word out there and uh, make that difference. But guys, we're doing it. We're, we're doing it. <laughs> Slowly but surely. Um, someone asks how long Hermit House has been breeding. 20, I believe she started in 2017. Guys, you could go to Mary Akers' blog. Um, Maryacres.com? Yeah, Maryacres.com, I believe. And she has a whole blog about all of her, you know, just like we do, you know, vlog. She did a blog. And you can read all about her attempts. And, you know, the first couple that she did also didn't have any success on land, but again, learned a ton, made some changes, tried again. Um, and so I think she began in 2017, if I remember correctly. Um, and then had her first success um, in 2018. But like I said, go check out her blog just in case I'm off on that. But, um, but yeah, that's, I believe. So Sue says she was thinking that the mega have not really finished with the water stage. So they're still mega and not glowy. Oh. That's hard to say. Um, oh. But they're swimming, um, walking in the water was her question. So the new term, the glaucomy, Glaucocome? No, it's uh, G L A U C O T H O E. See, this is why we go with Megalopa. <laughs> it's hard to pronounce, guys. <laughs> okay, so that could be the stage between when they leave the water but have not done that final molt to being a, an official land hermit crab. Um, I could definitely see that because there are different characteristics. You know, you can tell once they've made that final molt. Um, and their exoskeleton gets hard, you know, hardens up. Their eyes, um, you know, look a little bit different. The stalks of their eyes look a little bit different. So that, that could is be. still a question for Stacy. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Stacy um, has all that information. So yep. go with what Stacy says. We're yeah. going to check on that for y'all. Um, okay. 
What is the hardest part of breeding hermit crabs? The hardest part is um, all of it. All I mean, all of it. It's so it's very time consuming. Um, you need a lot of space, um, a lot of equipment, and and things like that. But I would just say, you know, they're just so tiny. And all of the just little stuff that has to be done is just all so little and miniature and, you're, and it's hard on your eyes. Literally, your fingers start to hurt with pinching that pipette. Um, it's very emotionally straining. You know, it's such a roller coaster, like from the highs of like, oh, we have a spawn to the losses of them, to um, like, oh my goodness, we have big over with, and then I lost so many of them. I mean, that was an immediate, you know, high and low right there. Like, I, we had mail over, and I turned around and like, they ate each other. So, <laughs> so just the ups and downs emotionally of it all too is, um, you know, the shells, finding the shells, um, and then going through them and cleaning them and making them sink in the water. Who would have thought that'd be a problem? Uh, you know, to just every step of the way. Um, it's just constant. And it's constant, I think, just trial and error because we don't have a lot to go off of. Um, so you're always second guessing yourself. Am I doing this right? Do they look right? Are they swimming correctly? You know, are they the right color? Did they, you know, what stage are they? Uh, just all of the, you're just always questioning yourself, I think, too, as part of it. They're saying they think it's pronounced Glockatho. Galakatho. Well, that's not too hard to say. Yeah. Galakatho. It's hard when you're reading it, apparently. <laughs> For us, anyway. <laughs> that doesn't really seem that hard. Galakatho, okay. Um, All right, guys, how about one more question? Ooh. Is that good? One or two? What do you think? Two questions. Okay. Last two, best two questions. Last two questions. Now we have to wait for the two best questions to come. Oh. Because you already answered the other ones. Oh, okay. So two last questions. Y'all get them in. Two more. While we're waiting for those, you have the live baby cam to watch. They're probably wondering why their light is still on. <laughs> well, it's 830. What all this noise is in here. Yeah. Usually the lights are all off by now. I had to go and turn all the timers yeah. off so they wouldn't go off during the live stream. Yeah. I will tell you guys, um, I don't handle the babies very much, but for to take some pictures, um, to get a close-up look, I have picked up the, the babies a couple times. One, they don't seem scared of me at all. Like they hardly even duck into their shell. Um, and if they duck into their shell, they immediately pop right back out and they are just so active. I mean, constant movement. I don't, I don't even know when they sleep. Like these guys never sleep. They're just moving and moving and moving all the time. Only when they're molting, I think. I don't know, they're just high energy for sure. All right, I have a good question okay. from Hunter Smith, who says, first, just wanted to say thank you for everything y'all do. When do you think the industry will be stopped? When do you think, like, what's your estimate of time frame here for this industry? Hmm. Well, that is a tough question. We're seeing huge strides. Um, you can also add in where do you think our project will be in 10 years? That goes, kind of goes together. Okay. Um, I. I mean, I think we'll see huge changes within 10 years. I, I do. I know, you know, we already have one retailer on board and once one joins the movement, you guys, it's so much easier to get others to join the movement. Um, and ethical breeding is big. Um, and so once that word gets out, once the supply is there, I think that's the big thing right now, kind of holding us back. We need more available. Um, when Josh, Josh's frogs, you know, went live with their, captive breads from Mary that first time they sold out very quickly um, and so the demand is there which is great um, but now we have to work on the supply and so within 10 years I hope we are there I hope we're one of the you know main suppliers I hope that we have exotics um, you know 
I didn't even tell you guys this, but as I was working on these guys, when I was doing a water change um, one afternoon, and I just looked up over here to one of our freshwater pools, and one of our lilas actually spawned eggs in the water pool, but it was the freshwater pool, and so of course they died immediately. But that's great news because that's, that means our lilas are breeding. So, I mean, we had strawberries and we had, um, we're pretty sure Brevi Manus. Well, we did have Brevies in 2020, but they spawned in fresh water. So we know they can breed. Yeah. They just didn't breed this last year that we can well, confirm. That we confirm, yeah. yeah. So, um, but we know we had Ecuadorian and strawberry, Lila and purple pinchers. For sure we can confirm this past summer um, and Brevies have in the past. So. We also have violas, um, but we have not, that we know of, seen them produce. I know we have males and females, so um, the potential's there, but... I don't think they're big enough. Well, right. actually, it could be <clears throat> the captive breads are breeding, but we don't yeah, know. Yeah, we have three. We have three violas, and one of them is a pretty good size. The other two are really pretty small, and so maybe they're just not... If they're females, time. they might be yeah. bigger. Who knows? So in 10 years from now, I hope that, yeah, that we're one of the, you know, main suppliers, that Hermit House Breeding has more breeders that join us and um, that we're meeting the, the demand and that we have um, exotics available. That would be, yeah, that's, that's my wish, my, my goal. All right, the last question is, what inspired you to start breeding hermit, excuse me, hermit crabs? Uh, Mary, I mean for sure because I didn't even know it was possible until I um, saw Mary on the Lycos group posting about her her journey. You know, her blogs were there, and we were reading, and I was so inspired um, at that time, you guys, that that we decided to drive to New York to adopt them in 2019, and so yeah, I mean we live in Texas. That's a long drive. Uh, you couldn't fly because you can't bring hermit crabs on the airplane. And so we literally drove from Texas to New York to adopt the first captive bred hermit crabs. That's how much it meant to me, um, to my family. And um, we were inspired throughout her whole journey. And even more so when we got to meet her in person um, and see her crab room and all of her, um, you know, mat where her magic takes place. And when we saw the babies in person the first time and um, got to pick them out, we were like, this is something that we need to be a part of. Like, this is why we started our channel. It's the whole reason behind Crab Central Station uh, was to educate and advocate. And what better way to do that than to play an active role um, in overturning the horrors of the industry. So it was in line with our mission. and. Uh, we we're like we have to try i mean we have to try who knew if we'd ever be successful but we couldn't just stand by and not try yep all right we did get a super chat from it's quicksand and they say congratulations on becoming an official breeder your tanks have brought some amazing inspiration to me while making and designing my own tanks all of your countless hours of dedication has really paid off good night ladies Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for watching tonight, for supporting our channel, for being amazing hermit crab um, owners and continuing to learn and grow your own husbandry uh, because we all, we all play a role in making a difference in this industry. Um, so no role is too small and it, and it takes all of us, which is why we call it um, a journey. You know, we always say welcome aboard um, because we're all on a journey at some point some different place along the route um, and we learn from each other and we grow and we change um, along the way and so we just want to thank you guys for being here with us thank you for being excited with us and um, we really look forward to just seeing you guys in the following videos as always if you have any questions feel free to dm us follow us on our um, social medias you guys for further tips and pictures and videos and we'll be spamming you with babies for a while i promise you that Thank y'all so much. We appreciate you, Crab Crew. Good night.